Hello everyone, my name is Erica. I am currently a nursing student. I am making this video to help anybody else out who is in med surge going through um, lectures. And this lecture today is going to be about prostate cancer. This is my sidekick, Jill. She's going to be with us during the lecture. You might see Jack walk by. Um, so we're just gonna get into it. Don't um, use anything I say against me. Please do all of your own research. This is just tips and tricks and things that I found in the book that were helpful to me. Um, so prostate cancer is an androgen dependent cancer. Um, so that means it is dependent on hormones in the body. So an example of this is going to be testosterone. Um, it can increase tumor size by the amount of testosterone you have. Um, it is an adenosarcoma. So that means um, cancer of the adrenal glands. Um, and this is a cancer that is only found in men because only men have prostates. Um, the top three types of cancers that men can have are going to be lung, colorectal, and prostate. Um, so it is a very common cancer that um, is found in men. And so what are the first things we wanna know? We wanna know risk factors, right? We have modifiable and non-modifiable, and this falls into um, primary prevention. So what risk factors does this patient have that we can change before it would turn into secondary prevention? So non-modifiable risk factors are things we can't change. So an example is going to be age. Um, after the age of 65 is when prostate cancer becomes more prevalent in people. Studies have found um, that is because we know as you age, the surveillance in your body um, does not work as well. Um, and you have um, mutations that go unnoticed that can proliferate that are not corrected by the body's um, normal genes that like the tumor, tumor suppressor gene and the proto-oncogenes aren't working as well. The surveillance isn't working as well because your elderly, old age and mutations kind of wiggle past them. Um, another non-modifiable risk factor is going to be heredity. Um, so if you have a family history of people in your family who have prostate cancer, you're probably going to want to be screened earlier than the average person. And the last one is going to be race. African American males are at a more increased risk of getting prostate cancer than the um, average white male. Um, so they're also going to be screened earlier. So just to backtrack the normal age that someone should start getting their yearly screenings done maybe at their yearly physical is going to be age 50. And then for anyone who has a predisposition such as um, race and genetic um, factors are going to be screened around age 45. Um, so just a little light bulb should go off to pay attention to these kind of risk factors in any of your patients who come in for their yearly physical, just to remind yourself. Um, other modifiable risk factors that we can fix in our primary prevention is going to be a diet of increased red meat, an increase of calcium in your diet if you're overtaking your multivitamins, um, exposure to carcinogen or toxins, so smoking, um, you know, if you work as a firefighter and you don't wear your helmet, like you're supposed to, um, so you can get toxins in that way if you don't take the proper precautions at your as your job as a um, chemical engineer. So just things like that, um, BMI, so if you don't have a healthy body weight, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, all of those are contributing factors um, that can worsen someone or cause someone to be, get, be at risk for cancer. Um, so now let's say we have John. John is a 60 two-year-old man. He just walked into your primary care office for his yearly physical. He um, is an average white man and he tells you that he's here for his physical. So what are we going to screen, right? So every year it's probably smart after the age of 50 to do a PSA. And this is a prostate specific antigen test. And basically this tells you um, this is a number that the prostate gives off as it grows. And so it can often be confused with BP, BPH, which also can have abnormally high PSAs. So that's why that is like a number one little light bulb. Um, the cutoff is four, so anything over four is going to be abnormal and you want to look into it further. But you also wanna be sure, so if he came in last year and his PSA was 1.2, and now this year it's 3.8. So it's not over four, it's not over the threshold, but wow, 
that grew a large amount in one year. So that's definitely something to look out for. So you're looking at um, trends. So if it's jumping so, so far, um, or if it's over four, you want to be like, hey, we need to do the next thing, that's abnormal. This is what you wanna do first because it's less invasive um, and it can be just added onto their yearly blood work. So if that's abnormal because it either just jumped a large amount of numbers um, compared to last year's or the last time they had it done or um, it's over four, then you do want to do a DRE. Sometimes it's normal for it's over if it's over four because we want to think if you have a patient who lives to the long life of 92 years old, right? And if at 56 it's 2.4, how long? I mean, they're living another 20, 20 something years. It's going to continue to grow. So it might not be abnormal for someone to be 93 years old and have a um, PSA of 5.6, right? Because it grows with you as you age it does grow. So those are always things to look out for. And you always want to pay attention to life expectancy. So when you're, when you're doing these tests and you're getting abnormal results, does this patient have a life expectancy of 10 years or more? Since prostate cancer is such a slow growing cancer, is it worth it? Are they having any risks? Do we need to intervene? Do we need to do treatment? Are they having any adverse outcomes because of it? Or do they just do they just have it and it's not causing them any trouble and we're not going to make it that any trouble trying to get rid of it because they have less than 10 years to live anyways. So those are always things to keep in mind. Okay, so we had a PSA and it was abnormal. So now we're going to do a DRE, which is a digital rectal exam. It is when not us, but a physician inserts a finger into the rectum of the patient. It's going to be lubed. You're going to tell them it's uncomfortable. You can have them in a sideline position. Um, and so what they're doing there, unfortunately, that's the best way to palpate the prostate. And what you're doing is you're feeling for nodules. Is it hard? Is it enlarged? And all of these are indicative of an abnormal prostate exam. So when you have both an abnormal PSA because it either jumped too many numbers or it's over four, and now you have an abnormal DRE because you felt nodules, it felt hard, and it felt enlarged, our next step is going to be a TRUS or transrectal ultrasound. So the only way to say, hey, this is cancer, this is not BPH, this is not anything else, is to get a biopsy, right? So unfortunately, the best way to view the prostate um, anatomically is going to be inserting an ultrasound um, probe into the patient's rectum. You have to know if they have an allergy to latex um, because the rectal probe can be latex, so that is one thing to always keep in the back of your mind. Um, and so you're going to insert it into the patient's rectum and you're going to aspirate um, using, using the images, using the waved images that the prostate makes with the ultrasound. That's going to lead you or needle. So, you know, you're getting an aspiration from the prostate. It's going to guide you. Um, once you get this biopsy, you're able to look at it under a microscope. And we're going to do two things. We're going to grade it and we're going to stage it. So for prostate, we do the Gleason scale for grading. So you can think GG, Gleason grading. And so this is when you're going to aspirate cells from both sides of the prostate. You know, just kind of, you want to get it from different areas. Um, and you're going to see how poor or well differentiated they are and then add them together. So one is going to be well differentiated awesome, looks like the parent cell, they're going to have a good prognosis, right? And so five is going to be poor prognosis, poorly differentiated, do not look like the parent cell. And then we're going to add them together. So if you got a sample and you graded it as a one, and you got a sample from the other side and you graded it as a two, they're going to have a three total, which is good, right? Because the highest you can get is 10. So if you're at a three on a scale of two to 10, doing pretty good. And so now we're going to move on to staging. So this is going to be the TNM, which is tumor size and location. N is going to be for lymph node involvement. And M is going to be if it metastasized. Um, we're going to stage this one to four. So one is going to be um, that it's local and it has not spread, that it's localized. And four is going to be metastasized. Um, how does something metastasize in the prostate? So what, 
what are the three mechanisms? So we know blood, right? Of course. So it has a lot, like that is a very vascular area. There is a lot of blood flow, a lot of blood vessels. So one, metastasize through the blood. We also know it has lymph nodes. So that is a very lymphatic area also. It can travel through the lymph nodes. And then it can travel by just direct extension. So your prostate is in, you know, quick proximity to your bladder, to your rectum, to other areas on your body where it can just grow and reach without having to travel through blood or lymph. It's just direct extension, exactly what it says. So if it does go through the blood or if it does go through the lymph nodes, what are the most common places it's going to metastasize to? So it's going to metastasize to your bone, lungs, and liver. And that makes sense because our liver is just filled with blood. We have so much blood in our liver. So when that circulation happens, it's going to go there. Our lungs, right? The blood goes straight to our lungs. So often for it to um, oxygenate, that's a really common place for it to metastasize. And then our bones, our bones are constantly, um, you know, blood's constantly traveling through them for it to go. Um, so diagnostic studies. So we can do a couple things. We have our biopsy that we talked about to either rule in or rule out cancer. Um, if we think it metastasized, we're going to probably do a PET scan and we're going to see areas of hot spots. Um, we also can just do an x-ray, right? Because this is probably the first thing you want to do. It's least invasive. Um, and you can also do a transrectal ultrasound. This is helping you um, see the spread of it. Um, so now you have to explain to your patient, we have treatment options. You know, you have cancer. This was the stage. This was the grade. Um, what, are, what are our treatment options? Um, sorry, I just want to actually go back. So symptoms. What are the symptoms your patient's coming in with before we go to treatment? What are the patients coming in with? So prostate cancer grows around the periphery of the um Bla uh, not of the bladder, of the prostate. It grows, it grows around it, so it won't occlude urine flow, and it's so slow growing. So one of the first signs and symptoms of prostate cancer is nothing. You will not get a sign or symptom until you are in probably middle phases of the disease because it's so slow growing. By the time it grows large enough, it's going to um, have you have a weak stream, urinary frequency, um, urine retention, things of that nature, um, an ability to achieve or maintain an erection maybe. And then if we, if we see the patient is having lumbosacral, lumbosacral region pain radiating to the hips, legs or feet, um, weakness, numbness, blood in the urine, blood in the sperm, then we're going to probably think that metastasize. We're going to think that because they're having pain in the other parts of the body. So that's probably because the cancer spread to those other parts of the body. Um, so that kind of goes into just saying like, hey, you got the stage right. Hey, you got the grade right. Those are just other little factors that can um, help you with grading and with staging. Because if the patient did report back pain, then you'll probably want to do that MRI or to do that PET scan and see those areas of um, it metastasized too. Okay, so back to treatments. So our non-surgical treatments, we have the first one and it is prostatic cryosurgery. And so basically you are injected with a liquid nitrogen and it, it works by freezing the cancer cells to destroy them. It is a two hour procedure that is done under general anesthesia. Um, this typically doesn't have a huge successful rate and it has to be done at multiple times. Um, it's either done in extremely early stages of cancer or as like a hope last resort for, you know, if nothing else has worked, why not try it kind of resort. Um, complications of it are just going to be damage to the tissue, incontinence, erectile dysfunction. Um, people choose this um, if they're in the early stages because it's a quick recovery. They didn't have any um, open surgery. It's not invasive. They're able to leave the office. So that's why a lot of people choose it, even though it's not the number one preferred method or the um, method that works the best. The next one's going to be radiation therapy. So this can be one of two things. Um, you can have a external beam, which has, um, which will do precise radiation on the prostate 
um, things to be mindful about this is it doesn't always just get the pro the cancer cells. It can affect healthy cells around the prostate. Um, and so things to look out for are going to be skin irritation, everything that we learned in intro to cancer. Um, so just skin irritation. You don't want to put any types of special creams on it. You want to talk to your doctor about creams. Um, and things of that nature. We're gonna move on to brachytherapy, which is a form of radiation therapy. And this is when rods or pellets are inserted into the prostate. You can only do brachytherapy if the cancer is confined to the prostate because otherwise it's not going to affect the other parts of the cancer. It's only these pellets are being inserted to the prostate to treat the prostate. So that's where the cancer all needs to be. These pellets or rods are going to stain with you forever. They lose radioactivity throughout the th throughout three months. After three months, they are considered not radioactive anymore, but they rods and pellets will stain you forever. Um, so there's a lot of education if you have a patient who opted to do brachiotherapy. Um, they need to wear a condom for at least two weeks after, I'm sorry, they need to abstain from sex for at least two weeks after surgery. After those two weeks, they can have sex but they need to wear a condom to protect their partner from radiation. You want from the radioactive um, sperm. And so you want to educate them that they probably will see blood in their sperm. Um, they probably will see blood in their urine. But that's because, of course, bleeding, you're injecting them with something, bleeding might occur. Um, so it's normal in that... Um, and that you take all precautions for them as their nurse, that you don't want to be around their bodily fluids for, the, you know, three months. Yeah, you're taking those special precautions that, you know, they flush the toilet twice, that they're, they're just extra careful. Um, our next type of therapy is going to be ablative therapy or androgen receptor blockers. Um, because a tumor is androgen dependent, like we talked about, we want to suppress the testosterone. We want to suppress those hormones. And so this would be a good idea for somebody who you it can be used as a neoadjuvant therapy if their tumor is very large and you want to suppress the hormones decrease the size of the tumor to remove it before surgery this can also be used for someone who doesn't want surgery who might have you know less than 10 years to live but maybe it's obstructing their urine flow stream and causing retention so we're going to want to shrink that um, to give them comfort for whatever time being that they have um, the two medications for this is biclutamide and flutamide. And so because we're suppressing testosterone, what do you think we're going to get? We're going to get signs and symptoms of a female going through menopause. So hot flashes, gynecomastia, breast pain, and erectile dysfunction. Um, we used to give patients estrogen. We found that this is not best practice because it can cause CVAs, DVTs, and MI complications. Um, and then we also have chemotherapy as a last um, non-surgical treatment. And so this is going to be um, PO or IV. Typically, chemotherapy is given to patients who become refractory um, to hormone therapy that we just talked about. So patients who have taken this hormone therapy for, you know, 10 years and now the tumor is... Um, unfazed by it and it's going to continue to grow and the hormone therapy is not working to shrink it or keep the size under control anymore. So chemotherapy, it's either PO or IV and it affects cell production at different stages. You want to use combo chemo so you can um, kill all cells that are cancerous within different stages of the cell cycle, you know, because if you only used one, then you're going to have an obscene amount of adverse side effects from just that one. And if, you know, five cells survive it and they move on to the next stage of cell development, then they get to proliferate versus having combo that can, you know, if five, five survive this round of chemo, guess what? We have this other medication that will kill them at that stage. So it's just maximizing the amount of cancer cell deaths. Um, so things for chemo, chemo kills cancer cells. Why does it kill cancer cells? Because they are fast, um, fast multiplying cells, other fast multiplying cells in your body, like your hair cells, your um, bone marrow cells, your red blood cells, your um, 
leukocytes, your um, platelets, all of those are, you know, they don't have it. They have a short half, they have a short life and they multiply quickly. So it affects all of those. So you're going to look out for thrombocytopenia. You're going to look out for neutropenia. You're going to look out for anemia, which is going to be, you know, you want to have all those precautions. So if they're anemic, you are looking out for fatigue. You're going to um, monitor their H and H. You're going to be sure of all of that. If they're neutropenic, you're not going to let them have fresh fruit, fruits and veggies. You're going to wear a mask in their room, have them wear a mask outside of their room. You're not going to let water sit still in their room for over an hour. You're going to wash your hands constantly. You're not, you're, you're scrubbing in and you're scrubbing out of that room. Um, so those are just things, you know, platelet precautions. You're going to make sure they're not falling. You're going to you want them to have closed toed shoes. You want to have, make sure the nurse call buttons there that they don't try to get up by themselves and maybe fall. Just soft toothbrush, um, electric razor. So just anything really that could contribute to um, making one of those exacerbated. And then lastly, we're going to have treatment that is surgical. So the most common is going to be the radical prostatectomy. And so this is the removal of the prostate gland and seminal vessels. Um, sometimes the lymph nodes are removed. It is surgeon dependent. There are many different types of the radical prostatectomy. Um, the different types include the retropubic, which is, I think, of uh, C-section. It is an abdominal incision. Um, the robotic or laparoscopic. And so this is Basically the same thing, one is done by a robot that the doctor controls and one's just done by the doctor and it's just multiple incisions on the abdomen. Um, we can have a perineal resection, <coughs> which many doctors like to do because they think it decreases the pain, but you cannot see the lymph nodes when you do it and because it's by the rectal area, it increases your risk for infection and you cannot give anything transrectal. And then we have the TERP. So the main thing with the TERP is you want to teach catheter care, monitor the bladder for spasms due to clots in urine output. If they are having um, spasms due to clots, we're going to give them bethanocol, and that's going to decrease bladder spasms. But we want to treat the root of the problem, which is going to be the clots, because the clots are causing it. So we're going to irrigate that bladder. Um, Post-op considerations. So like I talked about, you wanted to do teaching regarding catheter care. When should they call, you know, what kind of um, color urine is expected? Um, how do they care for it? How often do they change their bag? What um, looks like, what does an infection look like? What, um, how should they clean their genitals um, around it? Should they clean it? Are they too distraught to clean it? Do they have a loved one who's going to do it for them? So just figuring out what their plan of care is when they go home um, and get, getting everyone involved who needs to be involved. Um, so complications that can occur are loss of bladder and bowel control. And so with these patients, you want to give them oxybutyn, and this helps with overactive bladder. And so that's if they're having like urinary frequency, overactive bladder, like constantly peeing, um, oxybutyn can help. Um, also non-medical things that you want to teach them are Kegels. That's a big one you want to instruct your patient on and have them teach and demonstrate doing a Kegel exercises for you. You want to maybe have them keep avoiding diary so you're, when they report back to you, you're able to look at their patterns um, and see what their baseline voiding is. They can have erectile dysfunction. So if this patient is in their 40s, unfortunately, and they ended up getting prostate cancer, you want to make sure they go to a nerve sparing um, surgeon <coughs> who specializes in nerve sparing because this cannot be treated with sildenafil. You can't just give them this and it increase the blood flow because it's not a blood flow problem. It is a nerve problem and nerves sometimes cannot be repaired. You can't do anything about that. So definitely talk to them about that, educate that, them about that before surgery, you know, see where they are at in their feelings. Maybe <clears throat> have them speak to, you know, sexual counselors, relationship counselors, because that can cause a lot of problems in people's self-image and relationships and things of that nature. So definitely try to explain that to them and see if they need to follow up with a, um, a surgeon who specializes in nerve sparing. And can also get lymphedemia. So that's just morning swellingness. So you want to just have them elevate, you want to massage, 
And lastly, a stool softener um, to decrease straining because we don't want those patients to strain and um, affect their incisions or, or whatnot because they just had a major um, abdominal surgery. And so that was really it. Um, a lot of it kind of touches base it with things that we learned in our intro to cancer about radiation and chemotherapy. So definitely refer to that. <clears throat> If you needed more clarification on things, I think the top things to take out of this are risk factors, who who gets it and when sh what should we do, what are the tests we run, what are the ages we do it for, um, the difference between grading and staging, different types of non-surgical and surgical treatments, what are the signs and symptoms, and um, what are the medications that we use, which I think we all covered upon. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope this helps someone for their exam. Um, if there's anything that I said that you have questions about, please do your own research. Google rebuttal me. I'm still learning myself. I just do this to help myself and to help other people. So thank you very much for watching.